What would it mean to own a word? It seems clearly impossible to own most words, like the words the, or go, beautiful, tree, or zipper. No, actually, someone did once own zipper, had a trademark on it, but no longer. Now it's a regular word, like any other word, like tree. So what about a trademark term like Xerox? Every time I type the word Xerox, Microsoft Word capitalizes it, a not-so-subtle indication to me that I am somehow doing something wrong when I use Xerox as a regular verb. So can a company like the Xerox Corporation stop everyday folks like me from taking a trademark term and making it generic? Well, they can try, and there are court cases over trademark terms. There are actually linguists who specialize in this area and who serve as expert witnesses in these cases. I have yet to do this, but I know many colleagues who have served in trademark disputes. Why would a company want to do that? Why would a company want to go to court? Wouldn't it be good publicity for your trademark term to be used everywhere, to be used as a more generic term? These are the questions that we will discuss in this lecture. Xerox is actually actively trying to police their trademark, and they use Zipper as the example of things gone wrong. I recently came across an advertisement by Xerox which features a picture of a zipper. Underneath the picture of the zipper, it reads, if a trademark is misused, it could come undone. And then there's smaller print at the bottom that is worth reading in full. If you didn't know Zipper was a trademark, don't worry, it's not. But it used to be. It was lost because people misused the name. And the same could happen to ours, Xerox. Please help us ensure it doesn't. Use Xerox only as an adjective to identify our products and services, such as Xerox copiers, not a verb to Xerox or a noun, Xeroxes. Something to keep in mind that will help us keep it together. Is this really misuse of a name? Can't we as speakers use words any way we want to? Is it our responsibility to help companies like Xerox keep it together by not using their names generically? Do we as speakers have a similar responsibility to say football quarterback Tim Tebow, not to use his name to refer to getting down on one knee and praying. I will demonstrate the posture. This is something that quarterback Tim Tebow originally did after every score or win, but now it's come to be used by people at other times. They will call it Tebowing, as getting down on one knee in a position of prayer, and sometimes it's defined as doing that when other people are doing something else. For example, celebrating. And if you look on the internet, you will see people Tebowing all over the world, on the Great Wall, at their weddings. This is something of a fad right now, may not last long, but it was big in 2011 and 2012. So we're using Tim Tebow's name without his permission. People play with language all the time, including proper names and trademarks. What would it mean to stop them, to stop all of us from doing this? The process of a trademark term becoming a generic term, like Xerox being used generically to mean electronically copy, is a process called genericization, generification, or genericide, as in death of a trademark term through becoming generic. Google, Xerox, and Hoover have all fought genericization because they can see what many of us are doing every day. But don't worry, they're not coming after us as individuals. B.F. Goodrich fought for zipper too, but lost, retaining only zipper boots as a proprietary name. For companies, the key is that people are reminded that the term is trademarked, even if we're using it generically sometimes. 
In order to police their trademarks, they need to make sure that we realize this is a trademark term, even if we're throwing it around to refer to things that aren't that company's products. As long as we realize it's the Microsoft Word capitalizing Xerox, every time it does that, it reminds me that I'm using a trademark term generically. These corporations also try and minimize the use of these trademark terms being used generically in published documents or anything that's public or official. That's an important part of the work that they need to do to keep their trademarks. Before we talk specifically about more examples of genericization, I think it's helpful to think about this phenomenon in the context of a broader phenomenon, which is eponymy. This is the use of a proper name as a regular word. So we'll first talk about eponymy and then turn to words that have undergone or are undergoing genericization, some of which people don't even realize were ever trademarked, and some of which are contested to this day. In the process, we'll see just how much people care about words and how much they care about who owns them. We'll also see how difficult it is to stop some kinds of language change. Eponymy is when a proper name is generalized to something more generic, and this long predates the invention of trademarks. One of the best-known examples of eponymy is the word sandwich, which is believed to be named for John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. And the story goes that he was quite a gambler. Apparently, he once spent 24 hours at the gaming table, and his only sustenance was meat between two slices of bread, hence a sandwich. This is first cited in the OED in 1762. We have other words that come from their inventors. The verb pasteurize in 1881, that you'll see, for example, on a carton of milk, this is from Louis Pasteur, who invented the process of pasteurization. The term ritzy shows up in English in 1920, and this comes from César Ritz, who was a Swiss hotelier who founded many ritzy, so to speak, hotels, including the Hotel Ritz in Paris in 1898 and the Ritz Hotel in London in 1906. This is the same Ritz as the Ritz in Ritz-Carlton. The company adopted the name in 1927. A guillotine, which shows up in English in 1793, is a French eponym. It comes from Joseph Guillotin, a physician and a member of the French Revolution Assembly, who suggested the use of this particular device for beheading people in 1789. Now here's one that you may not realize is an eponym or linked to an invention, and this is the verb galvanize. Galvanism was borrowed into English from French in 1797, and it describes a chemically induced electricity. The word comes from the name of Luigi Galvani, an 18th century physician who first noticed the way that this electricity made the muscles in a body contract. In his case, he was working on a frog when he noticed the effect of this electricity. The verb galvanized was borrowed from French shortly thereafter to describe the act of applying galvanism, of applying that electricity, stimulating an electric current and making one's muscles twitch. Within 50 years, there's evidence of the metaphorical transfer in English to being galvanized into life or back to life. And you can imagine how someone's muscles twitching could then be extended to twitching back into life. And now galvanize can mean more generally being spurred to action, that there's no longer any electricity involved. And it's been pointed out to me that sometimes galvanize can also seem to mean to bring people together and spur them to action. So the verb galvanize has shifted semantically from its origins in medicine, and many of us may not be aware of its origins at all. Another interesting eponym has undergone a kind of metathesis, where the parts, in this case of a compound, have reversed order. This also obscures the word's origins. The original eponym is Burnside, 
from Major General Ambrose Everett Burnside, who served as a leader in the Union Army during the Civil War, and he later became governor of Rhode Island. Now, General Burnside was famous for the bushy whiskers he wore on the sides of his face, along with an almost equally bushy mustache. These side whiskers and the mustache came to be known as Burnsides in 1875, or sometimes just the side whiskers were called Burnsides, which had also before that been called mutton chops. From the description I just used, side whiskers, you can see how Burnside might have undergone metathesis to sideburns, especially once people didn't know who Major General Burnside was. So now we have sideburns, which come in and out of style. Like galvanize and sideburns, many eponyms are now opaque, hiding below the radar in the language. For instance, did you know that boycott is an eponym? It comes from Captain Charles C. Boycott, who lived from 1832 to 1897. He was a land agent in Ireland, and he was boycotted, so to speak. The OED provides the following quote from Dublin's Freeman's Journal from 1880, which describes what happened that year. And here's the quote. The multitude rushed to the residence of Captain Boycott, the agent on the estate, and the party against whom the popular ire was chiefly directed. And in a very short time, every laborer and servant employed on or around the place was driven off and cautioned not to work there again. In other words, he'd been boycotted. His workers left. That same year, 1880, we get this sentence in the Glasgow Herald. He advised the people to, quote-unquote, boycott any man who betrayed them by taking such land. So we see it spread to Glasgow. It's appearing in scare quotes. Also in 1880, the word shows up in Birmingham, in the Birmingham Daily Post. And here we get Mr. Patrick Fergus, merchant, Ballinrobe, has been boycotted, to use the local term. Once again, the boycotted is in scare quotes. This verb was spreading like wildfire. And actually, according to the OED, this verb appeared in French in 1880, Russian in 1891, German in 1893, and Dutch in 1904. I wanted to talk about this example in some detail because we can think that it's only in the Internet age that a new word can spread like wildfire the way the verb Google did. And we'll talk about Google in a few minutes. But it's important to remember that even before high-speed communication and relentless advertising, words could gain popularity quite quickly. So with that, let's turn to the sticky issue of genericization, which has sometimes taken words and linguists to court. As I've already mentioned, zipper was a trademark term goes back to 1925. But perhaps you knew that? I talked to some people who knew that and many people who are surprised. So let me give you a few more. These terms that used to be trademarked no longer are, and you can see which ones you realized had once been trademarked. So we have granola, aspirin, cellophane, linoleum, Thermos, pogo stick, yo-yo, and frisbee. Also, escalator and dumpster, but the escalator and dumpster are too big to get into a studio. How'd you do? On that list, Microsoft Word only tries to capitalize frisbee. The others have lost their trademark status, and dictionaries recognize this by listing the trademark as the origin or source, but not in the definition. However, with Frisbee, both Merriam-Webster and the American Heritage Dictionary still recognize the trademark in the definition, even if they note that the word is sometimes used in other ways that are more generic. The origins of Frisbee are interesting. It was brought to market by Whammo in 1957. It can be traced back to the Frisbee Bakery 
in Bridgeport, Connecticut, whose pie tins inspired the notion that a disc of this shape could fly. Whammo actually bought the rights from Fred Morrison, who had changed the spelling for legal protection. Dictionary makers are in a tricky spot as they try and capture actual usage of a term like Frisbee, but they may receive threatening notes from companies doing due diligence and policing their trademarks. As I mentioned, these companies need to remind dictionary users that the term is trademarked, and so they remind dictionary editors. If the companies don't do this, they could lose their trademarks, as King Seeley did in 1963, when a circuit court determined that the word thermos had become generic, and King Seeley had not done due diligence to prevent that from occurring. Other trademark terms that are being used generically by many of us include Band-Aid, Chapstick, Jello, Post-it, Q-tip, Kleenex, Vaseline, Rollerblade, Jacuzzi, and Tupperware. Sometimes I think it's even hard to think of what to call something if you can't call it by this trademark term. A Band-Aid is technically an adhesive strip. I have to pause to come up with that in my day-to-day -day life. And what would you call a post-it, if not a post-it? A little sticky note? I find the little item you use to clean your ears particularly challenging. What do you call this if you can't call it a Q-tip? The answer is a cotton swab. And the Q-tip website has a note at the bottom of every web page to remind us of what to call things. So here I'm going to quote from the Q-tip website. Q-tips is a registered trademark of Unilever and is not a name for just any cotton swabs. The Q-tips trademark can only be used to refer to the specific cotton swab products manufactured and sold by Unilever and should not be used to refer to cotton swab products of other companies or to cotton swabs more generally. Appropriate generic terminology for cotton swabs includes the terms cotton, stick or sticks, and swab or swabs. Misuse of the Q-tips trademark constitutes an infringement of Unilever's exclusive rights in the mark. So you can see here how the company is trying hard to police its trademark and remind us what we should and shouldn't do in terms of this word. Now once again, don't worry, Unilever is not after you and me using the term generically in our homes, which I would guess most of us are doing. They're worried about public published use. Now here's another very recent example of a company worried about genericization. In 2011, Microsoft filed a complaint against Apple's application for a trademark on the term App Store. Ron Butters, who's a linguist, an emeritus professor at Duke University, was the expert from Microsoft, and he argues that App Store is a generic compound. Robert Leonard, the expert for Apple, says that while the two words app and store are generic when they're used alone, they are a proper noun together as app store and should be trademarked. So app is generic, but app store isn't? Ron Butters explains this in a supporting opinion. He explains his reasoning for why App Store could be considered and should be considered generic. And it's worth quoting him in terms of his explanation of this phenomenon. So here's Ron Butters. Linguistically, a generic term is a term that names the thing itself. A computer store is a store at which computers are central to that which is offered for sale. A stationary store is a store at which stationary is central to that which is offered for sale. 
A grocery store is a store at which groceries are central to that which is offered for sale. And if next month a new and suddenly popular use is developed for the Mazer, and someone launches a store at which Mazers are central to that which is offered for sale, that will be a Mazer store. In other words, what Ron Butters is arguing is App Store is completely transparent. It is a store that sells apps. Apple sued Amazon over the use of App Store. But if you go to Amazon.com, you will still find there the App Store for Android. It appears to be alive and well. Apple has not successfully owned the compound. It appears to be available as a generic term for other companies to use. Google has had a history of policing dictionaries ever since Google became a word for the internet search engine in 1998. Google needs dictionaries to record the trademark in order to show that they've done due diligence. American Heritage Dictionary identifies Google as a trademark noun, and Merriam-Webster sees the trademark noun as the origin of the generic verb. The OED also mentions the trademark as the etymology of Google. A company like Google can argue that generic use erodes the value of their brand name, and this is really important for them, that their search engine is not any search engine. It's the Google search engine. But does this policing not allow dictionaries to do their job? Sidney Landau, who you may remember is the author of one of the authoritative books on dictionaries, is quoted in a 2003 article on the BBC News Online. The article was focused on Google's efforts to police dictionaries. And Landau is quoted as follows. In future, the effect might be to mislead people by only giving the trademark meaning. The effect is to suppress a range of common words and therefore censor part of the English language. So here you see an expert on dictionaries trying to protect the job of lexicographers, which is to record how we're using words. And he's concerned about companies in some ways censoring the language so that we would get some mistaken view of what a word means to many speakers and writers in the language. Speaking of companies' attempts to shape how dictionaries do their job, McDonald's complained about the definition of McJob and the 11th edition of Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, which was released in 2003. This wasn't about the trademark, but about the meaning. Merriam-Webster defined the term McJob as a low-paying job that requires little skill and provides little opportunity for advancement. You can imagine why McDonald's might be upset about that definition. McDonald's then CEO, Jim Canalupo, retorted that this was, quote, an inaccurate description and, quote, a slap in the face to workers in the restaurant industry more generally. But interestingly, news articles in 2011 reported that McDonald's had turned its attention from the dictionary definition and its concerns about how negative that, de that definition was they turned their attention to the public perception of McDonald's jobs after a survey proved that 80% of its employees enjoyed their work. Merriam-Webster itself has actually been embroiled in disputes about its own trademark, Webster's, and has actually lost such that Webster's no longer indicates that any dictionary was published by Merriam-Webster. This is because in 1889, the Merriam Company did not secure the exclusive right to use Webster's as a trade name when the copyright expired. Random House recognized the authority of that term that Webster's carried so much lexicographic authority with it and sometimes was seen as synonymous with dictionary. And so in 1991, Random House changed the title of the Random House College Dictionary to the Random House Webster's College Dictionary. Merriam-Webster, understandably, sued. 
But in the end, it was decided that the combination of Webster's with college did not violate any trademark. And so you will now see, if you go dictionary shopping, that you will see Webster's on dictionaries that are not published by Merriam-Webster. I was recently struck by some grassroots policing on the web, this policing around a trademark term that was pointed out to me by graduate student Justine Niederheiser. In this case, it's a response to a YouTube video posted about three years ago. This instructional video features a woman trying to help us all organize our plastic containers better. And she calls the containers in the video Tupperware. The video had viewers in a tizzy. They were writing these messages on the YouTube website about how upset they were about her use of the term Tupperware. And I'm going to read you a couple of the messages because it's fascinating the arguments that people were making and what they were concerned about. So we have one person who's watched the video who types, and much of this is in all caps, she has no real Tupperware. The term Tupperware is being falsely used to describe any old plastic containers, the kind you get from the deli, saved ice cream, or Cool Whip containers are not Tupperware. So here we have someone concerned that she has taken Tupperware and taken it through genericization and is using it for any old plastic container. Another viewer responds, Who cares what she calls Tupperware? She could just call it containers that hold food or shorten it to Tupperware like she has. Stop being jerks and just realize she can organize better than you. The point is that people care. We see this on YouTube with people arguing about how this woman is using the term Tupperware. So it's not just people running corporations. Like many other kinds of language change, genericization can cause people to feel concerned that the language is changing to its detriment or perhaps to all of our detriment. And in this case, unlike most others, corporations can take legal action against each other and send letters to dictionary makers about how they record language change. That you see corporations getting into the process of dictionary making as they try to help lexicographers remind us of where terms come from. But as examples like zipper, thermos, dumpster, aspirin, Google, and even McJob remind us, human creativity with language cannot easily be regulated. It's human creativity that gives us clever words like McJob. It also gave us McMansion, which was a term and still is a term used for the big fancy houses that got built, often with what some people would call new money. It's also human creativity that takes a specific term like Google or galvanize and makes it apply more broadly. I can understand why companies feel the need to police trademarks, but as a linguist, I can see all too well the uphill battle of a company like Xerox publishing a print ad to stop the momentum of millions of English speakers using their company's name generally as a noun and a verb. That said, the ad is doing its job by reminding us of what we're doing when we're using the word Xerox as a more generic noun or verb. And in the end, as history shows, usage determines meaning. Lexicographers recording the language in these complicated cases involving trademark terms must then to decide what to do with the fact that usage determines meaning as they are negotiating or getting letters from corporations. And speaking of history, let's now turn our attention back in time. I keep talking about borrowings from French and Latin and other languages. For the next three lectures, we will go back in time, many, many centuries, to look at the history of the English vocabulary that's led to the layers and layers of borrowed terms in the lexicon. We'll look at how it is that I can hardly get out a sentence without a borrowed word, like the borrowed word sentence.